Okay. Um, in our last class, we were introducing, um, really introducing chapter 6 of Revelation, but the way to introduce that is to show that only the Lamb could open the seals. And uh, some of our last statements in the last class were that <clears throat> there were these people around the throne of the, la the slain lamb and we didn't know how long they'd been there but when the time came for the book to be taken and the seals to be opened they were overjoyed and worshiping instead of freaking out that a bunch of trials and stuff was going to be un unleashed and uh, you see this picture a lot in the book of Revelation. It goes back and forth. Okay, so here's how they are in heaven. Yay, Babylon has fallen. And they're, they're going, ah. And, the, you know, there's always this stuff. So, <clears throat> so here you got in heaven, they're rejoicing. They're rejoicing that the seals are going to be open. Um, and what I say that... Um, only those who have been looking at the lamb on the throne long enough will rejoice that the seals are open so that they can have the lamb manifest in the midst of them. That this is good for them. They want the Lord. Okay. But throughout the book, the exact opposite is response is had by those on earth as they begin to scream in fear and refer to the opening of the seals as the apocalypse. instead of the unveiling of the lamb within. Now we call it the, re it's the same words, folks. It's called the revelation of Christ. The word revelation is also translated apocalypse. And they've made the word, the unveiling of the lamb to be an apocalyptic, horrible, maddening release of all kind of horrible things. And so they're going, well, we don't want this. You know. <clears throat> so um, I want to I wanna talk about now sort of a practical view of uh, some of the things that are in Revelation uh, chapter 6. And um, uh, I'm just going to read this, this part here. We've just, we've, uh, we have just given the explanation of how God intends to use the trials that open the seals and will unleash, and shortly we will compare these plagues to the one that happened in Egypt in the book of Exodus. So we're going to eventually get into comparing the plagues of Egypt with these plagues, not just the plagues themselves, but the purpose and stuff like that. But whether it be those in Exodus, those in Revelation, or what is going on in our lives, meaning the plagues, <laughs> all the trials that we face are meant to prove us as lambs and not just to show deliverance. Before we examine similarities between the book of Revelation and the book of Exodus, let us see how the seven seals can be applied in our lives as described in Romans 8, 28. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 8. Um, and when this verse 28 and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren um, now let's look down at uh, verse 35. <clears throat> what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, but in all these things, not without them, but in the midst of all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right. <clears throat> so that first list, who is, um, um, what shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. And I want to compare those with the seven seals. I wonder if the people he's talking about here in Romans 8, if they, if they saw this as an apocalyptic end of all things, or did they see this as the normal thing that there's, there's things you're taking through to get Christ formed in you? All right, so let's, uh, let's see. I've got my little chart I made somewhere here. It's real cute. Um, let's start with um, down here, seal number five, persecution, shall persecution are, and then in, in uh, the seven seals, seal number five, the saints are underneath the altar and they're crying out because they've been persecuted and put to death, all right? Um, seal number three is famine, shall persecution or famine, um, seal number three is famine. <laughs> okay. Um, and then um, seal number one down here, shall make it tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. Seal number one is the guy on the white throat, uh, white horse with a sword in hand sent forth to conquer to what is it to conquer uh, anyway with the sword all right and a lot of people i've heard a lot of people say well that's jesus no i've, I've heard that well he's on a white horse <laughs> yeah this, i mean that, we know that that yeah he had a white cowboy hat on too <clears throat> Um, the wording there, and I should have kept my place in the book of Revelation, but um, the wording there is he went forth, well, let's see, he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right. Does that sound like the lamb? Not with a sword. But does it sound like God, which Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you sound like they might be capable of not sparing you from some of these things? He that spared not his own son, how shall he not? And we'll get into that because that's all Romans 8. All right, bless you back there. Um, but the rest of them match up pretty well too. It's they, those were just like exact without any wiggle room. But uh, seal number two is tribulation. Seal number four, the, you talk about distress. Uh, seal number five, uh, we did that one, that one. Uh, I couldn't find nakedness on there except in the Garden of Eden. Um, peril um, is number six. So if you look at them, you look at the different things that are being unleashed that's the way we would we would say unleashed. We don't see, we've never read Romans 8 and said, oh my God, look at this stuff that's being unleashed on us. But we look at we look at Revelation and we say, look at this stuff that's being unleashed. It's not unleashed. It is, well, it's it goes right along with with a few verses up. All things. To be, called, to be conformed to the image of his son. So, going back to that. Um, so we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, whom before know he did uh, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. 
Paul starts off with the fact that all things work together for God's purpose. We are about to find out in the verses that follow that the apostle primarily highlights his use of trials and suffering because he says, all things work together for good, and then you start reading the rest all the way to the end down there, he's pretty much using trials and stuff, seals and stuff, okay? But he uses all things. Uh, but before Paul goes there, he wants us to be sure and understand what that purpose is. Is that purpose that of salvation, healing, blessing, forgiveness, or other things along this line? No, the purpose for which God will use anything at his disposal is that of getting us conformed to his image. And by the imagery given us in the book of Revelation, the image he once formed in us is that of the Lamb. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to be conformed to the image of his son who is a slaughtered lamb on the throne. Because his son is the one who died. And he cannot bring us into his image just by standing there like Jesus of Nazareth, son of God, and you standing there and he goes, oogie boogie, you know, and you, poof, poof. All of a sudden you are now in the image of God. Um, well, we would never use the oogie boogie part. We would just stand outside of him separate and say, oh, Lord. I'm sure y'all never prayed like this. Oh, oh, Lord. Way up there in heaven. Conform me to your image. I need you to do this. He's going, boy, do I ever need you. <laughs> That's the first right prayer you said. <laughs> and so we're, but, but he can't, it is just a fact. He cannot change us into his image apart from being one with him. There, there is no way. I mean, you know, we, let me tell you something. We value a whole lot of things in Christianity way above one thing that just does everything. And that is, because see, we're already one. If you're born again, you're one. But to come into that oneness is to come into the one whom we are one with. And the one becomes the one, see. And, and um, so there is no, uh, you know, and that, I've seen Bible school students come and go here and they just, they just want the Lord so bad and they want Jesus and they want to be conformed and they want the lamb um, flowing through them, but they never really lay hold of the truth of oneness because it's such a fascinating doctrine in people's minds that they just, they just think that that's all settled when that's the one thing that ought to get settled. I mean, the proof of that, I'll tell you how, the proof of that would be if Jesus, the Lamb of God, was right here and, and every, let's say that everybody got him for a month. <laughs> and he walked with you and, you know, but you'd say, yeah, you're the Lord. You know, and he's going, well, the Lamb is Lord. Philippians 1, R2. Uh, but we would just make him Lord. We wouldn't let the lamb be Lord. We, you're Lord. So he go, you know, and we'd be walking along, and then he starts swerving off over here, and, and we're still walking along, you know, and, you know, he might even have to go, hey! Because we don't even think like that. But it's not about thinking like that. It's about that life, that nature. It has to be true oneness. And the, the contrast of having him for a whole month following you around, you say something, and then you look up at him and go, boy, that wasn't the lamb, was it? You, you know what I mean? But if he wasn't there like your life is now, you, well, I'm just saying you got no contrast. You got nothing, you know? So anybody see the value of oneness? If nothing else, I mean, if you just had the contrast, that would at least bring you to Romans 7, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, which is, a, again, a good thing, not a bad thing, and the ones who don't want to come to that and don't want to find out how weak they are, that's their fault because, you know, and we, even as little kids, if we were a Christian or went to church or whatever, you know, 
Jesus loves me, yes, I am. Little children, they are weak, but he is strong. Yeah, okay. You're weak. See, instead of singing these really oh, strong oh, praise, da, 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 we ought to just sing Jesus loves me and that we are weak, but he is strong, and get that down. You know, here's our worship service, Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm 67 years old, and I'm going to sing it to you. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> so that's enough of that. Um, <clears throat> so here's a rough translation of Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew, he, he predestined to be conformed to this son, the one who was given. So that he might be the prototype of all others who would follow his nat lamb nature. The firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> you say, who, who put out that incredible translation? <laughs> That's why I called it rough. <clears throat> all right, Romans uh, 8, 31, 32. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that's spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also give us, all give us freely all things? So <clears throat> I wrote, if our comprehension of God in relationship to trials is simply to help us escape them, if, he's, if that's God's only purpose is to get us to escape them, then we might be encouraged by the wording of verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? We go, there it is. That's proof, Brother Randy, you're wrong. Um, it can be made to fit into the way we see things. But with that belief system, surely there is something ominous sounding when it states that he did not spare his own son. <laughs> the son he loves. I mean, I, I, I remember reading that even when I was in Bible school and going, God, I'm not safe then. <laughs> I mean, I did. You know, when you, you kind of going to spare him. I'm in real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, you know. <clears throat> and then I couldn't even go, well, how shall he not freely give us all things? He's going to kill you. <laughs> First of all, if God is primarily in the business of delivering everyone from their trials and sufferings, then why is Jesus going through them? And secondly, by saying he spared not, we are to conclude that he could have and just didn't. Maybe the explanation will be found in the verses that follow. This is an excerpt which I shall be putting in from time to time from my Romans class on Romans 8. Anybody remember that class? <clears throat> Anybody remember all the stuff I taught in uh, chapter 8? I don't remember everything I taught. I'm just messing with you. Okay, if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, you, you'll remember this. If God be for us, who can be against us? Excerpt from the Romans class. My response was, everyone can. Uh, the whole world will then be against us because God was with Joseph. His brothers turned against him. But, but look at the end result. He went into death and came out of it. Um, the list of bad things that are against us through the brethren and the world are found in verse 35 through 39. Peril and da 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 da. You know, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Who can be against us? The question is, who's for us? <laughs> if God, be, if God be for us, Amen. <clears throat> but these things actually give opportunity for us to practice the manifestation of Christ crucified through us. But it is not us. It is us bearing about his dying, 2 Corinthians 4.10. The proof that God is for us is not seen. The proof, if God be for us, if God be for us, see, we are, if the, the proof that God is for us is not seen in removing all suffering, but that he brings something greater out of it. Hardships do not separate us from the love of Christ, but gives us an opportunity to manifest that love through sufferings that are endured in order to bring others along. 
that kind of love is best expressed by means of these afflictions. And you remember, I, I've said several times, but I, I, this was, I remember this one in Bible school. As I, as I pondered it, I thought, you know, we would never know the Lamb of God if he, if he hadn't come to earth and died on a cross. I don't think anything was above anything that a prophet had ever done, right? including raising the dead and all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, there, you know, but at the cross, that's the Lamb of God right there, see? And then we began to know him in all of his selflessness. And he's up there bleeding and rejected and spit on and everything. And he's, he, you know, I mean, he's the Lamb of God doing that, but he's the Son of God too. He could have called 10,000 angels as Son of God because he had the power. See? He had the power. Son of God has the power to call 10,000 angels. Lamb of God won't call. You know, one reason why God doesn't give you power is because you'll use it. You know, because you, you could call five angels <laughs> and you'd call them. You know? It's like, I could call five angels. In fact, I'm going to do it. Get them! But that's the difference between the Son of God with power and the Lamb of God who is here not to be delivered, but to deliver us by not being delivered. <clears throat> um, that kind of love is best expressed by means of these afflictions. The love of Jesus is not just a self giving thing for us, but becomes an ongoing self-giving in us for others. That's verse 36. By possessing us, we will never become separated from God's love as a principle of life. See, or the nature of the lamb. The nature of the lamb. Um, Another excerpt. We see the life out of death assurance in the words, he who did not withhold his son, how shall he not freely give us all things? See, we just see that as, well, that's good. He died so I can get something. But he sees it as life out of death. He didn't withhold his son. And now we freely get all things from that as a result of his death. See, that's just, the, that's just the fruit of selfless giving. Something comes up out of a seed falling into the ground and dying. But we see it in a selfish, you know, I, I climb every promise in the book. You know, when I was, when I was in, younger in the Lord, people always were saying that. I, I claim every promise in the book. I said, well, you know, I was kind of a smart aleck. That, I, if anybody ever needed Jesus, I'm the lamb I did. But I was in Bible school. I, I claim every promise in the book. I said, you do? Yeah, every promise. I said, do you even know every promise in the book? Yeah. No. Or, you know, what if there are a thousand? How many do you know? You know, no wonder. No wonder. Yeah. No wonder they voted me president of the student council. They wanted to torment me. <laughs> yeah. Um, many see this statement as something bad, that God put Jesus through horrors just to give us everything. But offering him up in this way, offering him up is the way of God, not some horrible event. It only hurts if you're selfish. Because <laughs> we're going, no. You know, Jesus freely gave himself, and that's the important thing. You know, I mean, you do realize that free will is huge to God. God doesn't, you know, Jesus said, not my will. There, in other words, there's something higher than free will. He said, not my will, but thine be done. But, but God respects free will. God respects free will. You know, it was I tell him the other day, at the height of some of my persecution and stuff, someone came to me and said, do you realize all the junk that certain people are putting on the internet about you? What are you going to do about it? And I said, this is America. 
we have freedom of speech. We have the right to be able to say whatever we want. And I, I support that. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> you know, what? But it's true, isn't it? We're not in a country where well, they can't say that. And our laws say that they can't say that. You know? It doesn't change anything. Does it change Jesus? No. Does it change my relationship or yours with the Lord? No. All right, so um, this is the true, the true definition that God is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? This is the true definition that God is for us. He is a God who gives up what is most precious to him in faith. Who will condemn? The one who died and gave up his life in faith? and is still acting on our part and intercedes, he's not going to. He's not going to turn on us. He gave himself for us. And we, you know, if we're not faithful, God's still faithful. Amen? And, and you know, why is that important? Because we're not faithful. Because we're still flawed. We're, if, we're, if, if, if the cross settled it and the old man is dead and all of that is true, we still are funky. We see things wrong. We, you know, we, we haven't, if it was something as simple as we just haven't come to that place of maturity or something. You know what I mean? Or any number of things that come in, these things come in See, there has to be, there has to be this reality of oneness. I know I keep saying it, I'll say it my whole life. There has to be this reality of oneness that I'm one with him, not based on how I act or think or whatever first. First and foremost is he made me one with him. I didn't make myself one with him. That stands forever. Okay? You don't have to earn that. He did that. <clears throat> Um, therefore, if I'm going through something or, I think I was talking to Nisi about this, you know, you're going through something or, and, and it's just overwhelming. Do you believe that you can go through something in this life that is just overwhelming and for whatever reason you can't get over that hump? Do you believe that that could happen? Okay, how about this? Do you believe that medically, whether it was uh, you, you, you're an amputee or you know, a certain medication or whatever else, that it can affect you and you're still one with Jesus and he still loves you. And that he's not expecting what isn't there. And that's one of the things that I had to learn as a pastor on so many levels and so many different times that the truth is the truth is the truth and it's still the truth but God is love, and he works with us where we are. He doesn't go, he doesn't just draw this and say, everybody jump that high, you know. You know, so a little kid go, you know, he goes, get out! Disciples, go suffer the little children. <laughs> you know, some stupid thing that we, we think. The deal it relates to our heart. And it relates to a pursuit of his heart. And that's not going on a whole lot in, in Christendom. It is not their heart. And, it, and, and if it even was, they're not pursuing his heart. They're pursuing Jesus on a heart basis. And I'll be honest with you, most of what people think is pursuing Jesus on a heart basis is really just a soulless basis. It is human love. It is something that satisfies the soul, something like that. But if our heart is there with him, he says, doesn't he say, what does he say? If, you, if there first be a willingness, a willing heart, then what? It is accepted on that, on that basis, you know. <clears throat> that's, why, that's why I judge not. Because you don't, and I don't know. 
we don't we don't know everybody's uh, I'll, you hear me say this word a lot we don't know everybody's syndrome <laughs> we don't know everybody's syndrome you don't know my syndrome i know you think because i'm uh what is it eccentric that you understand me <laughs> but we don't know we don't know we don't know Therefore, our pursuit has to be just to know him and let him be formed in us. Okay, now I say that because it is so easy to become critical because we're not seeing him, the lamb. I mean, is that true? Um, just see him. And you really don't see others much. You don't, you don't glorify somebody above what they ought to be, and you don't put somebody down below that, what they ought to be. You, you, your measurement is Christ, and he's a measure within you. <clears throat> it's like the Holy Spirit, you know, over in Ezekiel. Show the house to the house. Show the house to the house. Okay, well, we're the house. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's walking through us. He's got the measuring rod. He takes it, and there's some great ones in that Ezekiel. And the wording, it really is eye-opening. He's, he's, he's measuring out, but he's showing things in light of his mind. Um, I've often been asked, well, what, you know, and read, you know, what is the Ezekiel temple? It's not the same measurements as the Jerusalem temple, Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, uh, so they call it the millennial, <laughs> the millennial temple. It's going to be the building we're, we're all hanging out in, in the millennium. Um, and, and it's not. It is the temple that he sees in his heart as he sees it. And the proof of that is that he gives, he, he, he makes incredible little statements around, well, I measure this and it's so-and-so cubits, da 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 And uh, uh, one that I've got shivers just to think about even saying is, he, he measures this wood altar, which there's a brazen altar and a golden altar in there, but where is this wood altar coming from? He measures this wood altar and he measures it all out and then he just says like this, and this is, this is the Holy Spirit who's doing the measuring. And, trying to bring us into his heart, the view of his heart of us. And he goes, um, the altar is the table of the Lord. Oh, God. Oh, my God. You start running that one through table of the Lord or table, you know. He'll prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. That, and that's a communion table. In fact, I think that's the word he uses. It's my communion table. Anyway. You know, there's just so much good stuff with the Lord. There's just so much good stuff. We don't have time to be messing around with putting everybody down. We need to be getting after the Lord. <clears throat> All right, so who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So Paul is making a case for the seven seals. He's making a case for them. Because, because all of this, it doesn't matter if it, the imagery is different in the book of Revelation than the explanation is, is in Romans 8. It's the same. See, the purpose of God and the heart of God hadn't changed from Roman to Revelation. It hadn't changed. Why could we not take what we've learned of his death and his nature and his selflessness and have it revealed through different kind of imagery over in the book of Revelation? Why couldn't we do that? But we get over there and everything falls apart. Uh, I don't know who this is. Jesus has got seven eyes. I, I can't even imagine. This is weird. I don't know if I can love him. 
You'll be eyeballing me all the time. <laughs> okay, Mike, don't laugh. Uh, what shall separate? Here he is clearly trying to make the point, not that we have nothing to worry about because we will be spared all trials and sufferings, but that though we go through them, the abiding fact will be that we are in the love of God. That's the, by this perceive we the love of God type love of God. Now I realize that we want to, uh, we want the definition of the love of God used here to be that no matter what we go through, God will still love us and that warm fuzzy feeling will keep us when people are being mean to us. However, <laughs> Maybe we should draw our definition from the cross where the greatest love that was ever known was on display. And maybe we should allow the scriptures to speak on this matter. 1 John 3, 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What is this verse explaining to us? It tells us that as the Lamb of God suffered for us, we ought to have that same spirit and approach at work in us. In other words, for us, it should not be about avoiding, escaping, and being delivered from trials, but allowing what worked in Jesus to work in us during such things. But at this point, we are but at this point, are we not a little disconcerted that the list of things mentioned in this verse are eerily similar to the seven seals? Eerily similar to the seven seals. All right. So, I mean, what are some of the things we can say then? If there was going to be an end time that was based on the book of Revelation, it was going to include all, all this kind of stuff. What should be our approach? Of course, store up food. Buy guns. Uh, you know. All of those things that everyone does. Because of why? Because they're, they're afraid, because of fear. Okay? Would it be possible for a person to comprehend Christ, the Lamb of God, Christ crucified in such a manner that if such a scenario were to take place on earth, that they would take what they've been practicing in Romans 8, and it would be basically the same thing that they would be putting to work in Revelation 6. Could that be possible? And the answer is, well, if it doesn't work there, it's not going to work here. If it works there, why shouldn't it work here? So, so what is the goal? The goal isn't to the goal isn't to live the lamb. The goal isn't to overcome trials. The goal isn't to make it through the great tribulation. The goal for all of us in every church is to know the Lord from his heart. And in knowing him, that answers all that stuff. There is no great sin in, in urging the church world to seek Jesus first. You know, so seek first and all these things will be added unto you. You know, I had someone come to me counseling or whatever. Actually, they were just standing around talking. They said, well, I need you to pray for me because, you know, my house payment is da-da-da-da and this and that and whatever. And I said, well... You know, it's maybe prayer and the answer. The scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. He said, I'm seeking Jesus. I said, are you seeking him first? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I've actually now got to my, my chart. I'm going to reread that last one because I liked it. But at this point, are we not a little disconcerted that the list of things mentioned in this verse are eerily similar to the seven seals <laughs> when they shouldn't be eerily similar? They should be looked at and gone, 
thing. That's, that's what he's going to use. He's going to use it for them, for those that maybe still can repent. He's going to use, he's going to use some of this stuff because that's the thing about um, uh, Revelation 6. Like the first four are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's what we call them, not the Bible. Um, but the four horsemen and uh, all of those things are happening on the earth, just to the earth, in general, to the earth. That means if your beast or your need to repent or your um, need to come to a recognition of your own weakness so that he can be your strength, so that you trust in him, or you need those kind of situations to be brought up to bear in your life so that you can manifest the nature of Christ, those things are all falling on the earth. See? Because he lets his rain fall on the just and the unjust. Right? Okay. Again, but as you get into past six and you start moving into it, then you start seeing, you know, you start seeing differences and you start seeing him dealing with a different kind of thing and and he moves on into that. I mean there are there are just little things throughout that don't even relate to this that are so cool in the book of Revelation. I mean the the seventh seal is the hundred and forty four thousand which is really those who are going to be followers of the Lamb and it's a number. But in that same book that's what is that verse uh, verse three I think but in verse 9, it's showing this huge multitude that no man can number. And it, you have to look close, and when you start looking close, you see all oh, these guys that will one day be the followers of the Lamb, they were sealed with the seventh seal, and then it's called it the, what is that, the seal of God. Or it was, it's, it's different than all the other seals. It is it's particularly given... Uh, the seal of the living God. These are going to be sealed with the reality of this, Romans 8 and, and, and Revelation 6. They're going to understand that this stuff works together for his purpose of conforming us. And so their minds are there because it says the seal has to be in their mind. Let's say, and he says, don't hurt the earth yet until. Don't hurt the earth yet until. Don't do it. They're not ready. I need them sealed. I need the seal of the living God in them so that when this stuff comes, they'll be able to respond. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to me. And where are they sealed? In their foreheads. Let this mind be in you, <laughs> you know? That's where the seal comes. The seal of the living God, see? Well, I can tell you that the first seal wasn't the seal of the living God. It, 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 hopefully it will help get people there. But this, I'm talking about the 144,000, and the other group in verse nine, multitude which no man can number, they've already died. They've come out of the great tribulation through death. They overcame through death. But these that are in the early part, chapter 3 and 4, they're on the earth. They're still on the earth. See? So these guys over here, maybe they've been sealed before or maybe they never got sealed and they just came through it because it just says it kind of like that. They came through it. But we know that, um, that this sealing of the mind is going to be bigger as we go. It'll, it'll be brought up more and more. If they were not sealed, who knows what we go through? You know, who knows what we would go through? Let's see.
All right, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you for the teaching that has gone before this when Nietzsche shared on the book of Revelation, Father. And I'll never forget this statement that she made. It is a book that views people in judges them according to how they relate to the Lamb. Amen. Amen. May we relate to the Lamb as after his kind. May he be formed in us, Father, by the Holy Spirit more and more. None of us have attained like Paul said, my God, if anybody had attained, it would be him. And yet, he says, not as though I had attained, but I'm pressing, I am pressing, I am pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, this, this stuff in Christ. And so, Father, we are here gathered, and there are those that are on Skype, that are as far away as Australia, other countries. We are all in different places. You know how to give bread to the eater and meat to the strong, milk to the babe. You, you know how to take what has been shared and without condemnation, break it down to their system so that they will get just what they need at this time. Lord, I just cover each and every one, and I ask you to do that, to break it down for their system and where they're at so that without condemnation, they may move forward on the wings of your word that you are establishing in us. My one prayer is that we keep our hearts, all of us, from wherever country we are, we keep our hearts focused properly on Jesus so that in the end we will have all come through this with Jesus and not on our own. What a, what a hard thing to go through these things without you. So, Lord, just be to us as you, you know to be. Thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.